the book of Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 through 20. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Any translation you're reading from will do. The Bible says, be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. And make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Don't be drunk with wine, because that will ruin your life. Because your pastor said, I have liberty, I'm going to take a little liberty, and if I'm wrong, I'll apologize. I never thought I was going to have to talk about drinking in Pentecostal churches. I'm not your pastor. I'm just going to tell you what the Spirit told me in January. I feel like I'm stepping on toes already. The Lord said it breaks my heart when my kids partake of the old wine, when I've given them the new wine. I'm not saying it's for everybody. You just pray your prayer and you see what the Lord tells you. But the old wine leads to death and destruction. The new wine is joy unspeakable and full of glory. We are having a revival of righteousness in the land. This is a revival of holiness in the land. Not, not religion, not legalistic, not legalistic legislated rules and traditions, but a revival of holiness where we're so in love with God, we're saying, I love you more than I love this. Is that okay, Pastor? I didn't say too much. Okay, good. Put the spirit down, pick the Holy Spirit up. Okay, I'm sorry, back to the word. Don't be drunk with wine because it'll ruin your life. Instead, be ye filled with the Holy Ghost, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs amongst yourself, making music to the Lord in your hearts, and give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, use me for your glory. Let everything I say and do point towards you. Touch our ears to hear, our hearts to receive, and our minds to discern what the Spirit is saying. And I ask that you would confirm it with signs, miracles, and wonders. And I say this house is ready for the ministry of the Word. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, you can be seated in the presence of the Lord. <clears throat> My sermon today is inspired by a road trip that my wife and I took a few months ago. I, I travel for a living and normally I'm only gone one or two days and I fly home. And one of the things that Gene and I like to do is we like to jump in the car and just go get lost. We live in the Smoky Mountains. And so it's easy to get lost in the Smoky Mountains. And so uh, on this particular occasion, I had been gone about seven days. She said, babe, I'm gonna pick you up and let's just go. So I didn't even have to come home. I mean, she picked me up at the airport. I threw the bag in the car. All the kids are at school. So we're just going to go have, spend the day. And we just drive up in the mountains and end up at antique shops and good food and just wherever, wherever life takes us, if you will. So we got this little convertible we like taking. And so I jump in the car. Well, you know, I'm extra Pentecostal. I mean, there's like Pentecostal and then there's, you know. Like Latino and Pentecostal, Rajatabla, for those of you from the East Coast. I mean, like, I'm like, ah, you know, so, yeah, like, I fall out by myself. I'd be at home, you know, on the bed, of course. I mean, no catcher. You know, like, I hurt myself. But. <laughs> and so, not only am I Pentecostal, my phone is Pentecostal, and my car is Pentecostal. I got choir music playing on here all the day long. It sounds like Friday night, a Church of God camp meeting every day in my head and in my car. And so as I'm getting close to the car, the car automatically switched over to my music, which involves organs, pianos, tambourines, and a beat like this. When we used to get the spirit in the 80s, like, I mean, that's why we all, I mean, we all had that little Pentecostal jerk because to keep up, I mean, now, you know, with those songs, shout Jesus, it's easy to sway, but back then you would just, I mean, if you, you just would jerk with the song. Can I get a witness on the front row? Oh, I mean, you couldn't help it, but people are like, what are you dodging? I'm, I'm oof, just catching it. I'm just catching it. <laughs> so I'm getting in the car and automatically it starts. And so I'm just, and I'm in the, you know, I'm just. 
I'm like T.D. Jakes in 1997. Get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. I'm getting in the car, and she's like, babe, could we maybe not? Like, I'm like, not what? Like, not have revival right now? She's like, can we maybe, like, turn something, like, like a little more romantic? I'm like, like, like Hillsong? I'm like, what are you looking for? Caleb? I mean... Little sister Charity Gale. I mean, what are you looking for there? She, she wanted this guy named Sinatra. I don't know, a bunch of devil music. She just wanted some wicked, worldly, something about fly me to the moon. I'm like, I don't go to the moon. I serve the sun. Glory. I'm just like. <laughs> By the way, my wife told me that I need to give a disclaimer here and let you know that she is not worldly. She is not ungodly. This is a holy woman of God, and she loves Christian music. And a little bit of the, you know, anyways, but. So it wasn't like, you know, real bad. So it's just Sinatra and Bennett. I don't know. Anyways, it's not my cup of tea. But that music's playing and we're driving and we're in the mountains and, you know, fly me to the moon. And she said, hey, babe. I said, yeah, babe. She said, do we have gas in the car, babe? I'm like, babe, it's 2022. If we run out, it's, it's going to ping at us. Like, we don't, I didn't bother to look down. I didn't check. I just was sure. Well, we got lost in what's called the Blue Ridge Mountains. It literally has a ridge of blue. It's beautiful. It's somewhere in North Carolina. Never been there before. We get in those mountains. We lose cell phone signal. And all of a sudden, I hear, beep. I look down. We got 20 miles to empty. I'm like, okay, babe. Now it's time to get gas, babe. <laughs> Turns out, there's a bunch of tree-hugging, hippie, electric car, bougie. I felt conviction. I felt like I just called somebody out over here. Bunch of Elon Musk. No, I'm kidding. But <laughs> turns out they don't believe in gas stations in the Blue Ridge Mountains. It was like being on like, like, a, like a Dr. Seuss book, because I looked everywhere. I looked here. I looked there. I could not find a gas station, Sam I am. And we get to 10 miles to empty, five miles to empty, and I wish you could tell I'm extra, but I wish I could tell you that I'm exaggerating the story. She's a witness there. We were down to three miles to empty, and I pulled that car over on the side of the mountain, and I said, Turn that devil music off. She's like, why? I'm like, because woman, I got to decree and declare a gas station into existence. We have no cell phone signal. We're going to get eaten by bears up here, and I can't prophesy to Sinatra. <laughs> when behold, I told him in the 9 a.m., I don't think I've ever used this word publicly. Behold in the thicket. That's the last time you heard the word thicket. Behold in the thicket. We found a two-pump gas station, little mobile gas station. And as far as I'm concerned, I spoke the word, and that word went from the end to the beginning. And got, as far as I'm concerned, I built that gas station with my spoken word. I'm word of faith right now. You remember, you remember Leroy Thompson? Money cometh, gas station cometh. As far as I'm concerned, I've spoken into existence. We get to the gas pump and an old man comes out, baggy jeans, uh, white t-shirt with those real big suspenders like you see on the movies. And he comes out, what can I do you for? I'm like, yeah, we're, we're here for the gas. And it's like, it surprised him that we wanted to buy gas from his gas station which led me to believe that that man is in the witness protection program and doesn't really run a gas station. <laughs> and I pull up in a red convertible. Hey, how you doing? I'm Tony. I need to... He's like, what do you really want? That pump starts... He had to flip a switch on to turn the pump on, and it's just... <laughs> I'm giving you a little more detail than the 9 a.m. service. And as they're filling the tank... I start pacing. I, I pace when I preach and when I get nervous. And I'm pacing in front of the car, and I realize I can preach a revival to my wife right now. Glory to God. I said, you know who this would have never happened to? She said, well, you're going to tell me. I said, this, I went full-blown into my preacher voice. This would have never happened to my father. I said, it would have never happened to my dad. 
My dad came from Columbia. Whatever you think broke is, he was 10 times broker. Dirt floors, outhouses, didn't finish high school, but they worked. They were crazy hard workers for life and for God. Married my mother, came to the United States, started shoveling snow for $2 an hour Then at a bank, and then he got a job inside the bank for $4 an hour. By the time he left the bank, was one of the vice presidents of the bank, started a church in Chicago that turned into 39 churches and was a bishop over churches in the U.S., Colombia, Mexico, and Guatemala. I honor my daddy today. And I'm going to say something. Now, I know you can't touch your neighbor because you're still a little nervous here on the West Coast, but look at your neighbor and say, don't get nervous because I'm not about to get political. But I hear a lot of people cursing this nation, talking junk about this nation. But if my daddy was still alive, he wouldn't say God bless America only on July 4th, but on July 10th and 11th and 12th and 13th, he'd say God bless this nation because God brought him as an immigrant to this nation and this nation afforded him blessings that he didn't have before. And I'm aware that we got our issues and we got our drama and we got stuff that we need to get right. But I can prove to you that God's hand is still on this nation. You ready? Everybody still wants to come here because they have it. We're, we've been so spoiled sometimes by the blessings and the, and the prosperity that sometimes we don't realize how good we have it. Now, that's not political. That's prophetic. You don't, Listen, you got drama in your family, but you don't curse your family. You keep working on your family. Let's not curse this nation. Let's keep working on this nation. My dad, because of what he came from, he had to work for everything he had. Nothing was handed to him. Nothing was just given. So he valued what he had and he took care of it, protected it because of what it cost him. When people are simply given things, they don't take care of it. They don't, they don't, they don't really you know, value it unless it costs you something. That should help you understand why God is so radical about you and why he'll go to the lengths that he goes to to take care of you. You weren't cheap to God. You cost him the blood of Jesus Christ, the only begotten lamb from heaven. You, you cost God his very best. And that's why God's already decided, I'm not going to let a devil steal you. I'm not going to let sin take you away. I'm not going to let the vices of this world overtake you. I bought you with the blood. I bought you on Calvary and I'll fight for you till the trumpet sounds. And so my daddy never would drive around with an empty gas tank. Now, Gina heard this whole sermon at the gas pump. I even took an offering at the gas pump. I'm like, Ooh, I feel a miracle offering right now. I'm like, who would I'm like, there's one person here right now that needs to sow. <laughs> I have a very weird sense of humor, but it helps me if you laugh. Cause then I'll stop it. Anyways, I told her my dad would never drive around with an empty gas tank. And we would go on road trips and he'd only use a quarter of the tank and he'd stop. I'd be like, Dad, why do we got to stop again? It was the 80s. There was no GPS. There wasn't MapQuest. There was nothing. Your cars didn't beep at you. You just ran out of gas. And I said, Dad, why you got to stop all the time? And he'd yell at me. You know, Colombian father, Latino dad. They, they, we're not fighting. We're just loud. Like, he goes, you don't know when the next gas station is going to show up. And you don't know if it's going to be open. He goes, you can't be lazy. You can't live careless. He goes, you have to live ready. You got to be prepared. You, you got to think things ahead. You have to live prepared, Tony. I can hear him in my mind right now. And I told Gina, I said, the difference between my dad's generation and my generation is we've become experts at living on E. When your car gets to E, you don't get nervous. You say, I still got 15 miles. It's not till the needle tickles the bottom line of the E then. Because we're experts at living on empty. We're, you, the car sputters and you're like, oh, it's just a little sputter. It's not, I mean, we're going downhill. It'll get me to the gas station. 
because we're experts. But the way that we're living our natural lives is indicative of what's wrong with our spiritual lives. We're living off of the fumes of our mother's prayer life. We're living on empty. We don't pray. We don't fast. We don't come to church enough. We don't open our Bible. And then when hell comes against us, we wonder why we're broken down on the side of the road. We wonder why we're in the condition. Lady, I'm, I'm not here to condemn you. I'm not here to throw rocks at you. I'm here to tell you what the problem is. You need to be filled of the Holy Ghost. You need to be filled of prayer. You need to be filled of joy. You need to be filled of the things of God. Your tank is empty. We're trying to live off of what another generation did. We're trying to live off of the sacrifices of a previous generation. And to every Isaac that's in this room, thank God for the Abraham in your life. Thank God for the Abraham that dug wells. Thank God for the Abrahams that brought prosperity. But I tell you, Isaacs, that God commanded Isaac to redig the wells of his father and then also dig some new wells. I speak to every second, third, fourth, fifth generation that's in this room. There's some work that you got to do. You got to invest in your own salvation. You got to invest in your own walk with God. What Abraham did is great, but the God of Abraham is also the God of Isaac and Jacob and Joshua and the rest of the generations. We're living on E. And the problem is, ladies and gentlemen, as old fashioned as it is, I'm here to tell you, Jesus is coming again. And you better be ready. Don't play with the mercy of God. Don't play with the grace of God. If God has ever forgiven you, I don't, if God's forgiven you, thank him for it, but protect it. And hear me, if you're in a place right now where you're not really right with God, I'm not here to judge you. I'm just telling you, get it right this week. Get it right. I come in the name of Jesus to tell you, get it right this week. Why? Because Jesus might come tomorrow. He might come at the end of this. I don't know when he's coming, but ladies and gentlemen, Jesus is coming again. If you could see into the heavens, I think you'd see the archangel Gabriel polishing the trumpet, ready to sound the alarm. The mercy hand of almighty God has cupped the bell of the trumpet said, not yet, but soon, Gabriel, not yet, but soon, but soon and very soon, ladies and gentlemen. I don't care who's made fun of it. I don't care who argues it. I'm telling you soon, the trumpet of the Lord is going to sound and I'm not going to be here anymore. I'm going to be in that great meeting in the air. They're going to come and they're going to knock on the door of free chapel, but we won't be here anymore. We're going to be on streets of gold. We're going to be dancing with our Lord and Savior. I'm telling you, Jesus is coming again. And for every one of you that's ever struggled in your relationship with your parents or your spouse and you didn't have affirmation, you didn't feel loved, you've, the first thing that happens when you get to heaven, you know what ought to happen? Is God ought to be waiting for you at the door. Well, well, well. Look who decided to stroll into heaven. Don't you have a lot of gall to just show up here. He should have the list of everything that went wrong. But the Bible says that the first thing that happens when you get to heaven is you're going to find your heavenly father cheering you on saying, well done. Well done. You made it. I know you tripped and fell. I know some things went wrong, but you made it to heaven. When you get to heaven, you're going to hear well done. You're going to be affirmed. But to every parent in this room, I didn't give this to nine o'clock. This is for the 11 o'clock crowd. I have this conviction over me. When I get to heaven, my first wife passed away six years ago, the mother of my three original children. We have five. We, we have weird language, but my three original. My stepdaughter, Macy, her father passed away 13 years ago. When Jean and I married, we had both lost our first spouses to cancer. And God took seven broken people and made us one whole family. But when I get to heaven, Jean has heard me say it a million times, I live under this convicting, and every parent in this room, I pray that you'd feel the same conviction. When I get to heaven, the first voice I'm going to hear is that of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But the next voice might be Jessica, their mother, or Corey, who I never met on this earth. And I don't want to meet Corey for the first time and him say, hey, Tony, thank you for stepping up. 
Thank you for helping with my family. By the way, where's Mylon and Macy? Let me say, man, I'm sorry. I didn't do my job. I don't want to get to heaven and see your mother again. And she say, the last thing I told you was to get my babies to heaven. Where are they? And me say, sorry. I was too busy preaching. I was too busy making money. I was too busy offended. There is a responsibility on every mother and father in this room, not just for your own salvation, but for the salvation of your home. I'm, I, listen, I feel like I'm prophesying to Noah's right now. I don't care if society rid ridicules us. I don't care if they don't want to get in the ark. You make sure your family gets in the ark. You make sure your children get in the ark. You make sure they get water baptized. You make sure they're full of the Holy Ghost. You make sure that your family knows what the language of the Spirit sounds like. You make sure that your, that your children see you praying in the morning and casting out devils. Make sure your family sees you reading your Bible because when it's all said and done, that's what it's all about. talking about what fills your life and fills your home. When these kids go to school, more mornings than not, you'll find Gina walking up the hallways. I'm not saying that, I'm not saying it's some big official ceremony, but Gina just be walking up the hallways of the house, praying, speaking in tongues, touching doors, laying hands. What's she doing? She's making sure the house is full of prayer. She's making sure the house is full of the glory of God. We got five teenagers at home. You don't think the devil doesn't try to creep into our home? You don't think bad attitudes try to creep in our home? But what are we doing? We're making sure that the house is so full of the glory of God that when the enemy comes in like a flood, it bucks up against the spirit of God and that spirit has to go back to its commander in hell, say, you can't touch that house. I tried to get in. I tried to take their kids. I tried to met, but you can't, you can't get in there. That house is full of the Holy Ghost. It's full of the presence of God. I dare you to go home and speak in tongues over the kitchen, speak in tongues over the basement, speak in the Holy Ghost over that house and watch as every demonic spirit has to flee because God will fill your house with his power. Give him praise in this sanctuary. It's what's filling you. This, you could pick up a newspaper and this Bible, and I could read both of them to you right now, and you wouldn't know which is the Bible and which is the newspaper, because they both are talking about Russia, and they're both talking about Ukraine, and they're both talking about when there would be enmity, hatred, bigotry. It's all in there, and it says, when you see these things, don't say the end has come. It's the beginning. We are living in days like I haven't lived in in my lifetime, okay? Now listen, this is relative to everybody. During the pandemic, I was guilty of saying, I've never been down this road before. And God's like, really? Like you've never had a bunch of funerals in your life and not know what tomorrow's gonna hold? We just, we're short-sighted. We're quick to forget what happened. Every decade has had issues and drama. But I'm going to say something here. I feel to say it. I'm 42 years old. When it comes to the hatred and the division amongst us, specifically in this country, in my, and I was raised in Chicago, it's never been this bad in my lifetime. I know it was worse at another time. But in my lifetime, in the places I was raised, it's never been this bad. And people are figure, trying to figure out, well, what do we have to do? I think I have an answer for you. It's not another round table discussion because we've been talking about this forever, arguing about it forever. We need a move of the Holy Ghost. I, and I'm going to make my case here for a moment. I didn't give it to them at nine o'clock. I'm telling you 11 o'clock people. I'll make sure you're awake for this word. We need a Holy Ghost revival like in the days of old. Listen, I can take care of the gender war and the racial reconciliation right now. Because when the Holy Ghost fell for the first time in the 20th century in Charles Parham's Bible College, there was men that were earnestly seeking the Holy Ghost. But God said, I'm going to mess with religion and I'm going to fill a lady first named Agnes Osmond. And just like I used Mother Mary to give birth to Jesus, I'm going to use Agnes Osmond to give birth to the modern move of Pentecost. 
So that takes care of that. Yep. Now, there was another young lady who came from Norfolk, Virginia, named Lucy Farrell, a young African-American young lady who got baptized in the Holy Ghost. And she called her friend William Seymour and said, William, you need to get over here. This thing, it, you need it. William Seymour was a blind African-American preacher who went to Topeka to be baptized in the Holy Ghost and they wouldn't let him in the room because of the color of his skin. And Brother Seymour said, you might not let me in, but I'm going to make sure that what's in there gets in me. So I'm going to sit outside of this window. And there was a man in there that opened the window and Seymour put his ear to the window and, make sure, and made sure that he caught the message of Pentecost. And a revival broke out in Azusa in 1906, just down the road. Do you know who the first evangelist is that they called to Azusa? It was a young lady named Lucy Farrow, that young African-American young lady. She was about 20 years old. She was the first one that they called, and they said, Lucy, who should we bring to preach? And she said, I'm going to tell you what his name is. His name is William Seymour. There was some bigots in that room that should have gotten the call, but their attitude blocked their calling. But God said, that man that they rejected and put outside of the building, I see him and I see his heart. And God chose that blind black preacher to come to Azusa Street and see the greatest outpouring of the Holy Ghost that we've seen since the day of Pentecost. You know what we need right now? We need another outpouring of the Holy Ghost. We need the infilling of the Holy Be ye filled with the Holy Ghost. You hear me well. Look at me, you online me, uh, audience that's here. Listen to me right now. We don't need a third political party. We need a, th a third great awakening. That's what we need. Not a third political party. The third great awakening. We, the church, don't need to be political. We need to be prophetic. We need to preach the Holy Ghost. We need to preach love. We need to preach reconciliation because that world has nowhere to look. Every system has failed them. Republicans and Democrats and Libertarians. Every path to success that people have been told, this is how you make money, this is how you succeed. Every system has failed and they have nowhere to turn. But when they look to the church, if the church looks like the world, they're not going to come to the church. But when they see that we're unified, when they see we have joy, when they see that we have money, hey, when they see that we're blessed coming in and blessed coming out, when they see that we're healed and holy and healthy and sanctified and wealthy, they're going to say, what is it about you? And you'll say, I'm full of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Acts chapter 2, verse 39, after the baptism of the Holy Spirit came, Peter declared, and this promise is unto you and unto your children and unto your children's children and yea, even those that are far off. He's talking about you and me. Oh, by the way, because I got excited and I forgot what I was saying. Because someone in the room said, yeah, but you know, they, they, you know, they started dividing in Azusa. Yeah, when they got political. They let all the initials in the room. Kojic, AOG, COG, UPC, AAPA, I mean, all XYZ. Every time the church gets political, we lose our prophetic unction. And they all split when their own camps. But then another revival came during the voice of healing. There was a lady named Amy Simple McPherson. Sister Amy drove her gospel cart from the East Coast to the West Coast. They told her not to set up in Indianapolis because there was a pandemic. She said, well, I'm gonna drive in and drive that thing out. And the newspapers reported that when Sister Amy showed up, the pandemic left. Sister Amy had a tent revival. She was the first person to have integrated tent revivals. And they say, the history tells the story, that members of the KKK showed up to Sister Amy's tent, ready to wreak havoc. And they came in, they said, Sister Amy, what should we do? She said, let them in. The Spirit of God will handle it. And while Sister Amy was preaching, hooded men came to the altar, 
pulled their hoods off and laid them at the altar, bowed their knees, gave their life to God, got right with God and got right with men. Now you hear what I'm saying. I didn't condone what they're doing. I'm just saying we have an answer. Our answer is let's introduce them to Jesus because the love of Jesus will eradicate the hatred of this world. A.A. A. Allen, all those heroes, some of these names you don't know. There's a mandate on my life to make sure that I'm a remnant for Pentecost and I keep the history alive. There's names you need to know like Jack Coe and A.A. A. Allen, William Branham and others that in their day, they were called the ABCs of the voice of healing. And in the early days, by the law, they had to have a rope in the tent that would separate white and black. But there was this man from Texas. You know how they are in Texas. Jack Coe, he said, nope, I'm not doing it. And the police came and said, Reverend Cole, if you don't put that rope up, then you're going to jail. He said, I've already been in jail. <laughs> they put him in jail one time for practicing medicine without a license because he was praying for the sick. <laughs> Some mugshots. Go, go, as, if my pastor, Pastor Sam was here, he'd say, go do your Google due diligence. You see his mugshot. Jack Cole said, I won't put the rope up. I don't care who comes here. Let everyone sit under the fountain of God. And then the spirit of conviction came on A.A. Allen and other heroes of the faith. And slowly everyone, A.A. Allen tells the story of when he was preaching and he said, get the rope out of my tent. Get the rope. Out. What did that? A move of the Holy Ghost. What we need right now is an old fashioned prayer altar. We need some church mothers that will take some authority and say, stop it. Hush. In Chicago, they'd say, shut up. Oops, sorry. They'd say, stifle yourself and get in this altar and we're going to pray through together. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna, we're gonna lock arms and we're going to pray. We're, gonna, we're, we're not going to be full of the things of this world. We're going to be full of the Holy Ghost. Last thing, and I'm coming to a close. This world lends itself to being full of depression, anxiety, contention, Change the channel. I'm going to sound like an old-fashioned preacher for a minute. I think you ought to throw your TV out. Or disconnect the cable at least. Because you got Wolf in one ear, Tucker in the other ear, the women of this view here, and the women of the other view here. You got the African-American uh, African women, you got the Puerto Rican women, and you got the white women, and then you just got the other way. You got all the women talking. And no one reports the news. They just get you lit up. And then for you rich people, you get in your car and turn on your XM radio. And you have more talk radio. And so when you come home and you walk in the door and your spouse says, hey, honey, you're like, what do you mean by that? I'm not honey. I have a name. <laughs> get rid of the contention. You could say, Pastor, but you don't know how many bad things have happened to me. You don't know how many bad things have happened to me. I buried my father, my first wife, and her grandfather all in the span of about 18 months. I lived through hell on earth. My wife lost her first husband with a five-year-old and a one-year-old baby at home. She lived through hell on earth. But we had to make a decision. I've had a few bad years. But like the old choir song says, Brother Gutierrez, you don't have to sing it tonight. But when I look back over my life and I think things over, I can truly say I've been blessed. I got a testimony. And I'm not going to let one bad day or one bad year or one bad experience cancel out decade after decade after decade of the blessing, the joy, the healing, and the hope of the Holy Ghost. Disneyland's down the road. And for you old school, real Disney fans, not this frozen stuff, but you know, OG, Winnie the Pooh fans, glory to God. Hey, Ah. You should know there's a spirit called the spirit of Eeyore. How you doing, Eeyore? Not good. How's your house? It's horrible. How do you feel today? I hate everybody.
I rebuke that spirit in the name of Jesus. You see all the negative, but can you tell me something good God has done? People keep lists of everything wrong that's ever happened to them. Where's your list of what good has happened to you? He woke me up this morning. He gave me another chance. He forgave my sins. He died on the cross for me. He healed me. He restored me. He blessed me. I got a house. I got a vehicle. If I don't have a vehicle, I have an Uber account. I lost money in Dogecoin, but I made money in Bitcoin. Glory to God. God has been good to me.